So here are our, our main presenters of our paper for today. As you can see here, Dr. Gary H. on nature conservation and sequence, Josephine Wu, holistic education and sustainable living. We will present about 40, 45 minutes, and then we will follow up with a Q&A. Ask your questions, please, via the chat box. Um, our colleague here at Saman will rec record them. We will make a selection. And for those questions which we are not able to answer in the, in the time, we follow up afterwards by email. You all have my email address because you got the invitation, but also you will receive that again in our recording. So I want to give first a quick introduction again of our, about our organization. This is our staff. So on behalf of all of them, thank you for joining. Uh, we employ more than 250 staff full-time staff, but another 50 contract staff. So 300 people are working here on the beautiful sites of Kadori Farm and Botanic Garden. And actually, we are a different site. We are, we call it a so-called site-based nature institute. We have 150 hectares of a, of, a, of a site, which was established in 1956 for migrants coming from mainland China to become farmers to make a living in helping themselves in Hong Kong. So a farmer, a farm, which presented chicken and sheep, uh, chicken and other animals, but especially expertise in microloans to the farmers for over 40 years to help to make them a living. But in the 90s, when Hong Kong changed from an agricultural society to an industri industrial and more service-based society, we also repurposed ourselves. And the barren hillsides, which you'll see on the background, that actually was KFBG 40, uh, 60 years ago. This is how it looks today. It's, you can still see in the middle, we still have remnants left of our agricultural part. We have tea plantations, and, but the rest is all being reforested. And reforestation, in a very qualitative manner with lots of different trees, is one of the mainstream things, one of the most important things of what we do. Gary will tell you a little bit more about our reforestation program over the past years, but especially our plans for the future. So we are a nature reserve now, doing research and education about nature, education, and also how people can live more sustainably. And on the site base, so here actually you will see, you have a view on KVG. We had on the rear side, on the back, at the, at the back top, you can see Tam Shan, the highest mountain of Hong Kong. And this is the valley between two mountain ridges with the road leading up to Hunyan Shan. So this is KVG, with the lower part actually where we are recording at the moment. It's three different sites. So this is the KFBG. And then uh, we also have something which we opened this summer and ID will tell you more about it uh, in, in later on. It's something called Kodori Center, a center for research which was established already in the 90s, given to the Kodori brothers to the Hong Kong University. And it's really hidden there in the forest because the, the, the trees around Kodori Center continue to grow. And it's hidden in forest, but this is how it looks actually. It's a retreat center where up to 100 people can stay. It's like a hidden gem in the forest itself. And what we do there is we, we recreated uh, a food hub, a hub for sustainable living and how people can use food, cook food, prepare food in a low carbon way, in an organic way, in a very healthy way. That will be the end of our presentation when IE takes over. So the three sites, it's Kadori Center, Kadori Farm. And then third, thirdly, we have the green hub, a center for sustainable living in Taipo, a village nearby, uh, where we have, where we demonstrate via courses how you can live more sustainably. And again, cooking and eating is a very important part. You see, you have a look there on the Eat Well Canteen. We have an Eat Well Cafe in, at KFBG, and we have the Food Hub. So, food as a way how to live more sustainably, because everybody who lives in Hong Kong knows how important food is for us in a community here. So just as a short introduction, I mean, over here, Gary will talk about nature conservation, and then Josephine and I will talk about holistic education and sustainable living. Gary, over to you and uh, for nature conservation. Okay, thank you, Wanda, and um, hello, everyone. Uh, so, so I'll be um, looking at our nature uh, conservation work and uh, under the, the four uh, sort of main headings uh, that you can see on the, the right of the screen. Uh, next, please. Let's 
So um, the, the, the Wildlife Rescue Centre is actually in its um, 30th year. So we celebrate uh, 30 years of um, operation uh, since 1994. And um, we've been sort of operating under uh, several key roles um, during that time, uh, which are, are presented on this slide. Uh, the key, the key areas are the rescue and rehabilitate, rehabilitation of native um, animals, um, which um, is how we started the rescue centre. Actually, we were focused on natives originally, and then uh, temporary holding of rare and endangered species from the illegal wildlife trade. Um, these are the, the species of animals that have been seized by the authorities and are transferred to KFBG for. Um, for holding. It should be short-term holding, but actually it becomes long-term for some animals that are difficult to place or that are under long legal cases. Um, but during those cases, we assist the government in trying to locate a long-term placement solution, uh, which could be a centre anywhere in the world, actually. Um, anywhere where, where there is a uh, um, sk the skills and knowledge to take care of those particular um, animals. Next. Um, I had to add this, um, this photo. It's actually quite an old photo, but it was um, taken really in the early days of the uh, the establishment of the rescue centre and it shows, um, well, it was Prince Charles then, it's now King Charles, um, um, opening one of our large um, aviaries um, uh, with uh, our chairman, Andrew McCauley, looking very young next to him. So that was a kind of a key um, event which took place in our very early days. Um, so now uh, the the we're looking at the admissions to the centre and you can see that um, um, we've got some, I mean, the yellow bars represent uh, reptiles and you, there are considerable numbers of reptiles which have um, been uh, arrived at the centre, uh, mainly in the early days, in the two, early 2000s, because um, these, are, these represent actually seized consignments of mainly turtles uh, that were destined for markets in Southeast Asia, mainly food markets at the beginning. And um, nowadays um, we're dealing with uh, smaller numbers, um, but of very rare high value um, animals. I mean, in 2023, uh, we received 5,000 animals, which was a 10% increase on 2022. And that included uh, 2,400 birds which is the orange bar, and then 1,500 um, snakes, which are the stray snakes, which are delivered to KFBG uh, following um, um, mitigation uh, process um, after conflict with uh, the public in Hong Kong. Next. And um, these pie charts uh, basically demonstrate that um, when we have received the animals, obviously they go through a lot of uh, medical care and um, captive husbandry. And in 2023, 68% of the animals that we, we took in survived. So you could say that they were saved. Um, and of those animals that survived, about 75% were either released back to the wild, so they would have been native, or rehomed, uh, which means that they would be exotic, non-native animals, probably being rehomed um, into a conservation program somewhere in the world. And, um, I think that my frontline staff would probably agree that this is one of the most rewarding parts of um, animal wildlife rescue work um, is to see some of those animals going back to the wild. Um, and just to let you know what the photos represent on the top left, we have a short-eared owl being released back to the wild. The short-eared owls are actually vagrants to Hong Kong, so we can release them locally 
although they're not resident birds um, in Hong Kong. So it's quite an unusual species to, to receive um, from Hong Kong. The lower left, left picture is of a, an endangered black-faced spoonbill being released. And I think this is um, this kind of represents one of the important roles of rescue work, where although we receive mostly common species um, through rescue, we do receive critically endangered and endangered species, which any release really helps to um, support the wild populations of those species. So it's an important role. The middle top is a crested serpent eagle, which um, you will know that is at uh, the top of the food chain. It feeds on mainly on snakes. So an important bird to get back to the wild. This is a juvenile. Um, lower middle, a um, red muntjac or barking deer. Difficult animal to keep in, in captivity during rehabilitation because they're very, very nervous. So it's great to see it um, running out of the box like this when it's released. And then, then on the right hand side, we have some black kites being released. And the bottom right picture, the black kite actually just after release, you can see a wing tag. Um, now, this was a, a kind of a, an important um, new uh, project that we started in 2023, late 2023. And this is what we're doing is um, our, our senior vet, uh, Dr. Grioni, has uh, sort of established a new project to try to get some post released data or information back on some of these kites that are released. So um, we've we've done a lot of publicity about this project and we hope that through kind of citizen science, um, people spotting the birds, our bird watchers seeing them, that we get some post-release feedback. We've even had one of these birds being, um, and it might actually be this one that was rescued by Shenzhen Rescue Center a few months back, and that bird was uh, successfully rehabilitated and released for the second time. And over to our um, wild snake rescue project, we had a an important um, um, a, a kind of a, a development uh, in 2023. Um, Actually, this year marks the 25th anniversary of even this project. So this project's been going on for a long time as well. But this was an important uh, development where we um, were training uh, the snake handlers that are called out by the police to capture a stray snakes uh, to rapid release these snakes. So instead of um, them coming all the way to uh, Kadori Farm and Botanic Garden um, to be re-released later, we were training the handlers um, and they were being tested, sort of they did a, an accreditation course, received the little um, card that you see on the bottom left of the screen. Um, and that is shown to the police to, sh to say to the police, we are qualified to release the snake close to where we have, where it has been captured, which is obviously a great, um, uh, forward uh, a movement for this project because it's good for snake welfare and um, also the resources uh, of the police and, and KFPG. And here we are moving on to some of the achievements of our uh, DNA uh, work and the otter work that um, our teams have been carrying out. Um, through the through DNA work, we actually uh, discovered a new species of uh, pangolin, which was quite a, uh, a big discovery. And it was, um, a, it's a global discovery actually. And it was uh, the media around the world picked this story up. Um, so so the basically we get the scales from the, the, the Hong Kong government uh, that, that are seized in Hong Kong. And we keep those ready to be used for research um, uh, um, projects, not necessarily from KFPG, but any researchers wanting to use those. And uh, that is where the cryptic pangolin was discovered. Um, and later, the univer a university in Yunnan found the same crypt cryptic species. So it kind of backed up basically what our scientists um, had already um, uh, discovered earlier. And there is a paper about this now. The pangolin on the right is not the new one. We don't know what the new one looks like yet. Uh, people are still looking for it, but that's a Chinese pangolin, which is the native species. And 
onto the otters, well, we use DNA actually to look at the otters' droppings um, or sprains because um, it's difficult to know sometimes whether those droppings actually belong to otters, but DNA helps us again to, to know that they actually belong to otters. And our, our China uh, team are busy looking at the distribution of the local Eurasian species and also following it into uh, mainland China because, of course, these animals, they don't really have borders. And we want to know which of the Hong Kong uh, animals are actually moving into Shenzhen or Zhuhai. And, and it clearly is happening because the results already show that. So that's an ongoing uh, project looking at probably Hong Kong's rarest uh, mammal. Okay, on to um, habitat uh, restoration. Uh, this is a, a, a key area of KFBG's uh, work and it involves many of our experts um, um, in different areas of, of this work. Our vision is to bring back biodiversity uh, to many areas of Hong Kong. And the way to do that is to uh, bring back the forests basically. Um, so bring back native forests. Um, um, and over the past decades, KFBG um, has been reforesting its site with up to 100,000 trees of more than 300 species being planted. So we've got quite a lot of experience in doing this, and this work is still um, ongoing. And uh, we're looking at quality uh, rather than quantity. So the species are being picked very carefully. And as I said, uh, we've got like 300 to uh, choose from. Um, uh, a, a good forest in mainland China probably has about 150 species of trees. So that gives us some guidance as to kind of the quantity um, of different species which are required um, in a good forest. Next, please. And um, this, this photograph illustrates what the forest will look like um, with a mixture of different types of trees and also very important, the, um, basically the forest floor should have a lot of different species of, of plants growing as well. So um, you'll find in Hong Kong that um, most of the forests, um, if they haven't uh, been assisted like this, they would um, um, have only a very few species, if, if any, on the floor because the canopies often are closed and so they're too dark for the, um, the growth of the sort of like the lower uh, plants. But this, this picture kind of demonstrates what we're trying to sort of aim for. Um, and where do the trees come from? Well, we've got special permission from the AFCD to collect seeds in Hong Kong. And um, during 2023, our uh, flora experts collected more than 30,000 seeds uh, belonging to about 200 different species of trees. So um, again, these then will go um, on to be propagated. Uh, next picture, please. Propagated at our native tree nursery. Um, and then they can be eventually moved um, into the new forests which um, we're developing. And actually in the tree nursery there, you can already see that we are not just growing trees, but we're growing some of the plants which are um, on the floor of the forest as well, which add to the diversity and actually add to the resilience of the whole forest. So it's very important that we get the mixed components of a true um, sort of natural forest. So in the future, um, well, we've got sort of broader, a broader vision for the future, which is considering uh, a planting um, in areas, other areas of Hong Kong. We've got the skills from our own work and uh, we'd like to see places in the Northern New Territories um, planted. Um, so we're looking at sort of large scale forest restoration in Hong Kong in the Northern New Territories in areas just like uh, you see in the picture here that have been denuded of uh, trees. They are quite bare, but they should really have trees. They should have um, 
secondary forests like the, the, the pictures you saw earlier. So we are, we are hoping that we can be involved in helping this to take place in Hong Kong. I mean, it was an idea originally conceptualized by Dr. Billy Howe from the School of Biological Sciences at Hong Kong U a few years ago. And the time is right, basically, to, to, to start to put some of this, um, this work into action and develop the forests. And actually, the restor restoration vision also aligns nicely with um, identified priorities um, under the Hong Kong uh, bio, uh, Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan. So it's something that, that really should be, be happening um, in Hong Kong. It's ambitious, but um, I would say it's a, a critically important goal for um, Hong Kong and probably a larger area of the South, South China. Okay, I think over to Josephine. Thank you, Gary. And good afternoon to you all. Can you hear me well? All Thank good. you. At Care Fiji, um, we believe that education should embody the wholeness and harmony found in nature. So in our programs, we have uh, four main types, um, which covers for the schools and also for the general public. And those are more from uh, the ecological point of view and also the content surrounding animals, plants, biodiversities, and also soil. And also we have our Kuduri Earth program, which I will also um, provide more details later, transformative and well-being programs, and also the arts program. And all these programs actually, we circle around the, uh, not yet, sorry, we circle around the um, holistic education philosophy, which try to integrate, integrate the science with intuitions, economy with ecology, and philosophy with practice. All this, we hope that we can actually foster a heartfelt connections with nature. And these programs that we are um, offering right now also encourage not just to use the brains, but to use more our hands and also to open our hearts. This is how we want our participants to transform by restoring and also deepening their connections with themselves and also with nature. Next slide, please. We take nurturing the young minds very seriously, which is one of our core duties. So um, right after the pandemic, actually, we uh, swiftly recommenced all the programs for the schools and for also for the young young minds. And it is uh, our great pleasure for our uh, passionate educators who started uh, all the work to guide them back um, to the nature. And this is what we do. We actually focus on uh, guiding their curiosity and also designing the new experiences. All this actually has uh, brought to, um, as we also bring to the school. Next slide, please. So last year, we, um, as I said, uh, we have actually um, started working a lot more with uh, the schools still to, um, you know, during the break of um, the, the, the interruptions from the COVID. So the schools were in a lot of uh, uh, demand for bringing the um, teachers and also bringing the students back to nature. And we started partnering with schools with uh, a lot of uh, new uh, ways of engaging them, say multiple engagement. So students and teachers also come to uh, KFBG and also some of the key partners, they have started to work with us to deploy the interdisciplinary teaching and learning. Um, what does that mean? This means, for example, um, the students actually uh, come to us uh, regularly, uh, maybe four to five times in one year. And also they learn to, for example, work with the soil and also they might work or talk to the botanist and also talk to our farmers. And this year we also started uh, bringing the Dutchman pipes to some of the, um, uh, this is a host plant for the endangered uh, 
uh, bird wing butterfly in Hong Kong. We bring them to the schools and the school is setting up um, the habitat for the bird wings, uh, which we think it is uh, one of the important tools to uh, learn about um, the urban setting uh, for the uh, local species and also for the biodiversity in Hong Kong. And this is how we actually worked with um, the local schools at this moment. So we are going to do a lot more in the partnering, um, uh, in the partnership. And also the teachers are also coming to us. Uh, for example, they arrange uh, the whole day of uh, professional development and they come here to have some downtime, they hike, they also work with our uh, plants and et cetera. And also uh, last year, or I mean, just this uh, school year, we have uh, also um, produced a program catalog, which we sent to all the schools and uh, teachers actually can find uh, more comprehensive information about our programs. And this aims to actually use uh, KFBG as a place base to raise the eco-literacy in the local schools setting. Um, this is something we find very important because of the eco-literacy is uh, an important um, uh, element uh, for our common future because uh, our future generations really have to think out of the box or they really have to look at how to um, live a more sustainable life um, because of due to the many reasons that uh, things are not working out right now. So next slide, please. So the slides are coming a bit slow sometimes to the next version. I click on it, but it's very really heavy. So it, you may sometimes need 10 seconds before you go to the next one. But I guess, Joe, the next Thank one you. could be over here. Please. Okay. So these are some of the, the uh, pictures that uh, shows uh, the participants uh, coming to KFBG to work with us. So we work on the plants, we work on the soil, and also um, the center, the center photo actually is a, a group of university students who come to um, uh, us as an intern. So they spend about six weeks uh, with our team and we nurture them and also um, train them up to become uh, nature educators. And then they will work with um, uh, our team to actually deliver programs for the younger um, uh, students or for the young kids uh, which you can see on the next uh, picture uh, on the right. So these are the programs that are very important to uh, our, you know, our core, because uh, this is how we also uh, recruit a few of my teammates, and they become very, very important staff members uh, who has worked with us, and they know us very well, our value, and also how we deliver the ecological programs to the general public as well. Next slide, please. And uh, the Kaduri Curve program is also another important pillar in our project. Um, the, in last year, we have got um, uh, the series of online talks um, uh, filmed under We Are Nature. So these are the speakers. Uh, some of them are very uh, renowned um, international uh, ecological philosophers like Satish. Kumar and also like uh, Vandana Shiva who uh, advocate about uh, seed preservations and also uh, David Abram who talks about um, the, the, the anime earth and also um, Om and also uh, Manish who talk about uh, eco village life and also about uh, livelihoods. And um, this year we are saddened by uh, the passing of uh, Dr. Stephen Hardy so uh, he will be remembered and also we will keep on our work in uh, the anime earth and also on the ecology area. So we will keep his legacy and uh, I'm honored to have the chance to work with him. Um, so we, yeah, we are a little bit yeah, emotional here. <laughs> and also, uh, next slide please. Um, for the residential retreats uh, last year, we actually had brought uh, three speakers to um, to Hong Kong. Um, Satish uh, came uh, in October 2023, 
and uh, we actually launched uh, his uh, book in the uh, in the Chinese editions. And so we filmed um, the retreat and also his visit, uh, elegant simplicity. And we have brought him to schools, and also we have uh, 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 quite a few uh, engagement activities with the general public, and also in dialogue with a local um, uh, monk, uh, Chanin Fasi. And also in um, March 2024, uh, our chairman, uh, Andrew McAuley, together with Colin Campbell and John Quano, has also uh, facilitated uh, another retreat. Um, the power of ritual, learning of ind indigenous wisdom. Um, this is a very, very um, special uh, retreat. And also, um, we also bring uh, John to uh, a lot of uh, the schools and also to uh, engage with students, which um, the students love to learn about the Papua history and also how they live, uh, which engage, I mean, enhance the understanding of the world will and this is the transformative program. And also we have been uh, offering this um, as a regular um, program, uh, which includes the forest immersion walk because um, the forest and also the stream at Kaduri Farm and Botanic Garden is a place where you wouldn't want to miss. So um, I hope that you can also spare time to come visit uh, our nature space. And also um, we have local um, teachers who work with us. Um, the picture on the top right is with Jeanette uh, Lau. She is a yoga teacher, so it's very popular. And also the one uh, at the bottom right is a uh, single artist, uh, Zhang Meng Tong. So he is actually um, facilitating an experience, uh, uh, The Little Fish Journey, which is a story written by our chairman as well. So all these uh, had attracted, um, actually there are more programs and had attracted 3000 participants uh, last year as well. And then the last program that I want to talk about is the Artist in Residence program. So I'm waiting for the slide. So last year we have uh, uh, got the open call uh, in Hong Kong and also for the, you know, well, actually it's a worldwide uh, uh, call for artists. And this, um, and we have three artists uh, um, joining us. And one is by Kawa, which is a music journey. So uh, he is doing alternative music uh, in, uh, the, uh, in KFBG along the stream and also using different kinds of uh, soundscape. Um, to help uh, people to actually immerse in the nature environment. And the other artist is Arbe Chris, um, is, uh, on, uh, the film is on oneness, and also is more on the painting of the local biodiversity. And the last one is uh, by David Singh Moore Shu, and he is a soil artist. So the work actually uh, featuring uh, different soil uh, colors in um, uh, KFBG. And this year, next slide, please. We are working with uh, Kay Wong. She is a um, fashion upcycling artist. And also, uh, she has worked with a lot of uh, different kinds of programs um, to make use of used materials. And uh, she spent a lot of time foraging in um, KFBG to look out for different materials. And this, uh, uh, with the help from our foreign uh, conservation team. So uh, she appreciates the nature materials like the weeds and also maybe some of the invasive uh, species. Um, and there is a quite a, uh, extensive uh, creations that she has done uh, in the last few months. So um, the exhibition will open in uh, November. So please come to our art house to appreciate our program. And there will be workshops uh, that goes with it too. And next is the very last slide. It's about our corporate program. So I just want to bring um, forth that uh, quite a number of uh, organizations or institutions actually spent 
um, their, um, their C-suite days with us. And sometimes they also bring uh, their own staff here to have a day spent to do team building with us. This is uh, one of the financial institutions in Hong Kong. Uh, the team came here, spent a day, um, have fun in nature and also do a lot of uh, um, reflections and also how the team can work better. Um, the picture is taken in uh, our uh, Gunyam San, uh, the top mountain summit area uh, with one of uh, the used uh, banner uh, from just, you know, um, from, from like a recycled materials. So they actually f feature their uh, thoughts and also their reflection and learnings and bring them back to the office. So this is a uh, fun in nature plus hard work and hard, uh, play hard. So this is uh, my sharing. Thank you. And I pass on to Ivy. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, so um, agriculture remains important in KFBG and ha it has gradually unfolded to the regenerative agriculture and sustainable living program today. And this is what I would like to share with you more in the coming few slides. Next, please. So in the recent decades, the farmland at KFBG has been gradually transformed to a living demonstration of regenerative agriculture. Those of you who come over here before, you may have seen our sustainable farming practices, um, the permaculture garden design, and also the agroforestry. We also emphasize on recovering ways to resource like um, the organic matter and water, um, which is recirculate within KFBG in order to build up nature-based solution, which will improve the health of our soil, the ecosystem, the species, and also enhance the overall resilience of the site in the long run. Next, please. Our work actually also go beyond KFBG boundary. We are very concerned and also making effort to conserve farmland in Hong Kong. Following a survey report that was issued in spring 2023 to highlight the high ecological values of farmland in the proposed Lofton Metropolis, another farming farmland survey was actually undergoing in collaboration with university and green groups. The report was released this summer and it is now available online and you can actually download and read the report from our website. And the key recommendation that we put forward uh, include highlighting the urgency to execute a policy and also related measures to preserve the agriculture priority areas. We also identify seven priority farmlands that um, are very important and also we recommend designate them as agricultural priority areas. And we also urge for um, the town planners to adhere to the urban rural integration principle in the Lofton Metropolis planning to balance the need of agriculture development and urban development. And also um, looking into the world of agriculture, it actually indicates culture has an important role to play so our sustainable loving program focus on mainstreaming a culture for sustainability and it connect farmland with farmers and also farmers with all those who rely on farmers, which means every one of us. Next, please. And collaboration is actually a key work and also a key strategy that we employ to co-create wider possibility. And here we can see the green hub which is one of our major projects. It is a collaboration with the Hong Kong government, which transformed um, the old type of police station, which was left unused for a decade, for se several decades, to a community hub to promote sustainable loving. The project itself, we take it as a national research to inquire the application of integrated conservation design in community settings. So from last year on, um, we have 
been inquiring um, the different application from different perspectives and also aligned with um, the different perspective that is in the mainstream system. For example, the UNESCO Cultural Heritage Award um, that we have gained, which recognized the heritage preservation aspect. We also aligned with the Hong Kong um, Award on Environmental Excellence to inquire how we can employ and also advance the practice on catering service and so on and on. So we are looking into what is being recognized in the mainstream, but also trying our best to advance the status. So the projects have been running for 10 years now, and the site is greener than before. For example, um, with the continuous enhancement, um, all the trees look white, uh, looked black better now. And also, um, we have also been um, using the hub as a base to bridge community collaboration. So here now, um, this line is talking about um, the um, metaphor that we have been using to design our program. Joe mentioned earlier about the importance of eco-literacy, and we also find food literacy is very important to shape a culture for people to help themselves to live more sustainably. So in all our program design, we sort of guiding people through an inquiry on how we eat, what we eat, and why we care through a different dimension like knowing, belonging, um, doing, sensing, feeling, and also at the end, being as well as um, understanding the path for resilience. Next, please. So to further this work, um, actually we have another collaboration project with the University of Hong Kong at Kaduri Center, which was mentioned by Wanda earlier. So the project uh, transformed um, a canteen block, which was left on you for over 10 years, and we have transformed it now to become a food hub. And the process itself, we look into um, the best practice to manage the project. Like um, we adhere to the building environmental assessment method in designing the whole renovation work. And we also apply innovation to advance the ecological um, significance of the design. For example, the white dots that you can see from this picture here um, on the glass, they are actually for um, preventing um, first strike on the glass. So the project is um, the canteen block, of course, it have to serve food. And the, for the food that we serve, uh, we are trying to manage in a way that is minimizing the ecological footprint of the service, but also maximizing the, eco the education impact of what we have been doing there. So the next slide, please. So for people who are coming over to the food hub, um, we are, aiming to offer two main um, uh, ways for them to participate. Firstly, they can um, join a sustainable food experience and also through the experience, they can connect to how, being, how food is being produced and also how they can eat in a way that supports greener or sustainable initiative. And on the right hand side, we also run workshops for people to dive in deeper, to inquire about the relationships the relationships between us and the food, between people, and also between us and the environment as a whole. So this project is now uh, entering the test run stage, and I will invite you um, to come to join our program in the coming months. We will announce the detail later. Next slide, please. So the food hub is actually um, established at the Kiduri Center, which is um, very close to Kiduri Farm and Botanic Garden. It is within walk distance. So we are seeing this collaboration, like many other collaboration we have, is a one plus one synergizing and infinitive possibility. So this is the strategy that we have been working out in order to widen the spectrum and also widen the perspective and participation of sustainable loving. That is how we are talking about like the mainstreaming of the culture. So I invite you to be part of it. And um, I look forward to see you in the Food Hub as well as at KFBG. So this is the end of my sharing and I hand over back to Wanda. Thank you, Heidi, and thank you, Joe and Gary, earlier.
So to all of you, if you have any questions about the presentation or about any our any report, which you can download from our website, either in Chinese or in English, uh, please go ahead. Uh, you can ask the questions in the chat box and actually it's a man will give them to me here. So while we're looking at the questions, one question I have to start with for ID, which often comes up because now we have this beautiful food hub in the, in the forest. How can people go there? Is it just a place where people can go individually and have food or do you need to sign up as a group? How can people become part of this program? Thank you. Sure. Um, so for the food hub, yeah, yeah, I just got unmuted now. Um, so for the food hub, um, we will run program in connection with our existing program at the Dury Farm and Botanic Garden so that people can join our program and also have a connected experience with the site. And also for Kaduri Center, it is actually a much bigger facility, which have very well equipped with guest room and also um, lecture hall. Lecture hall and people can actually apply to use the site for organizing activity and conference. And the food hub is there to serve the catering service and also supporting people to subscribe different program. We offer cooking together experience to let people to witness our um, experience from food to table. And we also organize fermentation activity for people to dive into the cultural background of why and how people eat in the past and how our environment change in a way that shape our culture in a different way and how to get back to have more autonomy in deciding how we live. Okay, I'm just uh, trying to read quickly the questions here. Can you open the presentation again with Q&A? So <clears throat> one, one thing, of course, how do we relate all these things? Because sometimes it looks like that KUBG is the last almost conglomerate of different activities. So maybe Josephine, how does the Food Hub relate to your educational programs and, and how does it relate what's happening in the Kadori Center and Food Hub to your programs? Um, thank you, um, Wanda. I, I think uh, there's a lot of synergy that uh, we can actually um, bring in the food literacy together with the eco-literacy that we are working on. Um, say, for example, we uh, have um, the Soil, Seed and Food uh, program recently. Um, we have invited uh, Satish Kumar and Vandana Shiva to do an online course for us. But then um, on the on-site, we actually have uh, brought uh, the participants uh, either to um, KFBGs uh, to do the farming activities or actually have uh, the food um, appreciations as part of this whole experience. So this is one way that uh, we work together um, to bring out um, how the um, holistic education or the experiential uh, um, learning can be done. And also um, a lot of our programs, actually we um, use uh, the Kaduri Center as one of our base. So the Food Hub will be the core in uh, all you know, how we actually work with the two space. Um, so I think, I mean, the two spaces. So this is part of the the, the equation, I guess, uh, in our future um, programs, either for residential or one day program. A technical question, which actually we get quite often. So this is one for uh, for ID. ID, <laughs> what's the difference between regenerative agriculture and organic agriculture? Hmm. I would say it could have no difference, but it could have a big difference. Depends on how you sell it. Today, more and more people associate uh, organic agriculture with the certification that, of course, it actually attached with a lot of different practices that govern the certification process. But if we look in a holistic way, organic agriculture could be deeper in the way on how you talk about um, preserving the vitality of the soil. So now we use the word regenerative agriculture is to emphasize that. And what we look into is not about whether the product gets certified or not, but also look into the area in the long run and also its relationship with people in the long run, how we can organize in a way that um, the farming practice 
will contribute to the long-term fertility of the soil, the water circulation, et cetera. So let me give one example. Um, we are now also looking into like um, agroforestry. It is a very different way of gardening or farming, which we follow the nature principle of observing how natural forest, the structure of it, and also use it um, in designing our farmland. So using this approach actually is um, sort of a lighter approach of gardening or farming, which um, can preserve um, the overall ecology um, in the long run as it become an ecosystem that have its own way to regulate it. So um, our regenerative agriculture is aiming to make, uh, to, to, do, to convert our farmland with this kind of fertility that it is more self-resilient, self-sufficient, and also resilience um, to shock. So it is, um, I would say, reframing um, ourselves from organic agriculture to regenerative agriculture is a way to help us to bring into a deeper perspective and dimension in how people farm and hope so our relationship with the food in the long run. Thank you. Actually, I got quite a few questions about farming now, which which actually I like because um, can only farm in botanic garden. We still call ourselves a farm. Now, we often explain to the public that we are not a farm. The, the F from Kadori Farm Botanic Garden is a minor part of what we do, but it is part of our heritage. The farming is very different as agriculture, industrial agriculture, what you see as food production. So our farming is a way to produce food in, in line with, in, in a way it doesn't harm nature. So it's be organic, regenerative, but also it has to be healthy and making sure that it, it, we don't use any pesticides or herbicides. So that's maybe the production method. And of course, the size of our production is not very, uh, very large. It's more about education and showcasing purposes. But one important part of our farming is our tea plantation. I just get a, a question called from Dreamy Wong, a, a dreamy, a, a wonderful name, saying, actually, can you tell a bit more about your tea plantations? And yes, I can do. I will do in a minute. But then I also hand over to, to Josephine. We have two tea plantations. We are the only organization in Hong Kong with large active tea plantations. We produce our own tea, we sell our own tea. You can buy our own tea here in, the, in, the, in our farm shop, but also we're doing increasingly programs about tea. I know Joe, we didn't, uh, didn't prepare that. So maybe you can, you can tell a bit more about our tea programs. Sure. Um, I think um, the tea actually is a very important um, part uh, in the holistic, um, we call it experiential or transformative program. Firstly, we offer the tea ceremony, um, which is a, a way for us to really appreciate um, tea from the heart. So um, we, we don't just look at tea as um, a drink. It's actually something we treasure because of uh, at um, KFBG, we simply know where the tree comes from and also um, who actually do the processing of the tea. So it's all coming back to uh, our connections with the land and also the water. So if you join, you know, have a chance to join our uh, tea ceremony, um, you will taste very, the tea differently from what you experience um, outside of KFBG because we use um, the stream water to also brew the tea. So all this uh, coming back um, to how we feel about um, our connections with the nature. So this is what we do as part of it. And this year, actually, we are um, quite uh, uh, excited uh, because we joined it, um, uh, the tea, um, the international tea tea fair um, in the convention center uh, by putting up a uh, a booth um, to talk about how we um, plant tea and also how we process the tea, and this actually is part of the education um, that we bring forth to the general public about uh, the possibility of local tea uh, production or local tea growing uh, is possible in Hong Kong. So um, yeah, visit our farm shop. <laughs> if, you, if you have a chance, uh, get a pack of uh, the tea that we produced 
uh, yeah, is uh, worth it. Thank you, Joe. I, I get more a, a few specific questions about pangolin DNA scales as well. It's quite specific, so we'll get back to those questions uh, via Gary via email because we're coming closely to the end of our webinar. But I have one question here coming in from a certain Mr. Perkins, if I'm correct. And how KVG can, with all their programs, can support employment opportunities within Hong Kong, certainly about the sustainability sector. And actually, that's a very good question. First of all, we are a reasonably large employer ourselves. We hire about 60, 70 people a year, new, because sometimes people leave, sometimes people immigrate, but actually quite extraordinary. Also, we have every year eight to 10 people who retire, people who work actually eight, more than 20, 30 years sometimes here. And today, actually, we had a, one of our agricultural uh, team retiring after 22 years. Actually, we have in, in, uh, interestingly, most of the people working in our farms are female, which is quite different from a lot of countries in the world, at least in Europe. And uh, this lady retired after 22 years, but she will often stay with us after retirement too. So we do employ, or we recruit about 60, 70 people a year. So look at our website for vacancies. But also we are increasingly involved in educational programs from universities. So we do teach about sustainability, about illegal wildlife trade, about how um, how nature should be part in, in, in the curriculum. So it's eco literacy from three years old until university graduates. So in many ways, it's mostly about education, but also uh, giving employment opportunities. I could continue here, but I'm, I'm afraid that we have to close the conversation here for now. For information if us via email last night please it's my email address and uh, people you have my email address because you got your invitation and you if you can say you, you will receive the recordings but also for the people who didn't uh, who were not able to participate we often question get a question how can you support kfbg well of course you could you can of course help us with our financial part, with donations, we are a large organization, we do a lot of different things, but also we have a lot of volunteers. And if a simple thing is just visit us, come to this beautiful place here in the Northern Territories, close to uh, the Chinese border. In my view, and not just because I work here, but I've been living for a long time in Hong Kong, it's one of the most beautiful parts of the territories. So visit us, see what we do. And if you want to have more details from what we do, please uh, download our our report, which is on the website. Yes, we get a question here. Is it possible to have your presentation slides? Uh, is this possible? Just drop us a note. Normally, I'm a bit reluctant to just give a presentation without explanation, but we can give you the PDF file. You can see the email address here below, and uh, just send it to me, and you'll get the presentation in PDF format. So thank you again for joining us today. Thank you for your time on this, uh, on this beautiful Wednesday here in Hong Kong. I hope, again, you enjoyed it. I hope you will visit us. Have a good day and hope to see you again at least next year for our next annual report. On behalf of Gary, Josephine, Heidi, and all our staff here, thank you.